Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Stiff Me On My Bonus. That's going to cost you. Many many moons ago, 1999, I started work as a pub manager for a successful independent pub, decent salary and even better profit related bonus scheme. The owner had just bought an old bank with a large car park in an ideal location for a large gastro pub just on the outskirts of the town center. It was in the direct footpath between the train and bus stations and the main bar area so its footfall would be excellent. Over the course of the next 12 months I worked excessive hours running the one pub whilst helping him design and set up the new pub. It was fun and rewarding both financially and emotionally. The design of the gastro pub was excellent, it was oriental themed with an open plan kitchen so the customers could see the chefs working and as the owner had an oriental girlfriend all the chefs were from her extended family, this point is key to the revenge. We opened with a bang and the place was a roaring success, far busier than we had dared to hope and the initial new opening buzz just never died, we just kept getting busier and busier and I was working 7 days, 80 plus hours a week between the two pubs. We had to employ a second manager to run the first pub and ship even more of her extended family over to work in the kitchen. By the end of the first year my bonus was close to double my salary. In fairness to the owner, he worked more than I did and I got on really well with him. Then he screwed me over. He married his girlfriend and she and I had never really got on very well but she left me to do my job whilst she mainly looked after the kitchen side of things. The owner bought a brand new top spec Porsche and the wife got a new top spec Mercedes, I bought myself a Suzuki motorbike. All was going well until it came to my yearly bonus time, I was expecting it to be a lot less than the last year, what with the additional manager and that we were no longer running so short staffed, but it was drastically worse. By my calculations it was almost £15,000 short, just checked, that's about £25,000 nowadays. I of course queried this with the owner, it turned out that the company had bought the Porsche and Mercedes as company vehicles and that was above the line for my bonus calculation on the profit and loss, they'd also fudged some major capital investment expenses into the repairs line, also above the profit line. I was not happy to say the least but since we worked so well together I thought he'd be open to sorting it out somehow. But his wife stepped in and even went as far as to say if they could have lowered my bonus even more they would have as wasn't worth it. My personal life was in tatters and I'd been thinking about moving on anyway, all the money in the world isn't worth it if you work so much you ruin relationships. So I handed in my notice on the spot. This suited the wife perfectly, she made me hand over my keys and said I'd get my pay in lieu of notice, owed holiday pay etc but I wasn't to ever set foot in either of their pubs ever again I was barred for life. Cue the revenge. The problem with treating someone who knows the exact ins and outs of your business with such disregard is that they know all the ways you have been breaking the law. Those chefs you brought over to work but never bothered to get visas for because it's too much trouble and too expensive be a crying shame if someone called immigration to let them know. Those company vehicles that were never used for company business. Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office to let them know. That fudging of the profit and loss to reduce the pre-tax profit. Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office with details of what to look for. Those cash in hand staff you employed so you didn't have to pay nicks. Be a crying shame if someone called the tax office to let them know. For good measure I also rang the local environmental health officer, I wasn't sure as I didn't deal with the kitchen but I was pretty sure they were breaking some of the hygiene laws. I knew for a fact, control of substances hazardous to health, was broken as it was always the cheapest cleaning chemicals she could find so we never had data sheets. The fallout was epic, it hit the local press and the pub was closed for almost 4 months. I have no idea how much they got fined but it had to be far more than my bonus would have been. The next one is titled, Excuse me ma'am, I think I found your items and it said, reward if found. I worked for this really terrible supervisor a few years back. I don't know what her issue was but she was hell bent on making my, and only mine, life a living hell for her own personal pleasure. I won't go into specifics but she was sadistic and I think she actually got off on torturing me. Finally the day came when she left and celebration doesn't even begin to describe my emotions. 
However, right before she left I decided to get my revenge. I went to Goodwill and bought just a bunch of random crap like books, old CDs, DVDs, and cheap stuff. Inside the covers I wrote her name, her office phone number, and made sure to put in their reward if found. Then I proceeded to distribute all of the items in random parts of the city like bus stations, train stations, restaurants, the beach, or any public place. It only took a day for the calls to start coming in from people who found the items. At first she was calm and explained that she didn't lose any of the items. Then it escalated to her screaming, look I didn't lose a hootie and the blowfish CD and even if I did why the hell would I give you a reward for finding it? It got to the point that upper management actually chewed her out because of the amount of personal calls that she was getting to her office phone. This caused her to temporarily disconnect her office phone because of all the calls she was getting. A couple of months afterwards she was when she got let go, and happiness is too weak to describe the emotional feeling I got. It wasn't because of this rather a culmination of things which upset management, which included how she treated me. However seeing her melt down because of random strangers calling her work number and then her getting chewed out made me smile. The next one is titled, Using me to babysit your kids while you cheat on me, look out. Harry and I had been together for three years. He had two kids and as a result we didn't want to rush moving in together. For the three months prior almost every week on the days when Harry had his kids he would have to work late and ask me to look after his kids for him. I'd pick them up from after school care, make them dinner, get them ready for bed etc. There had also been a few times he had been offered an overnight shift healthcare, and I had babysat then too and taken them to school the next morning. I was happy to help as he seemed to need the extra cash and had borrowed dollar dollar from me. Anyway I was dutifully watching a kid's movie when my friend messaged me that she had seen him in a club kissing a woman. I said she must have been mistaken because he was at work but she sent me some pics and sure enough it was him. I was livid but had to keep it inside for the kid's sake. I put them to bed as early as possible and tried to stay calm waiting for him to come back. Then the message came that he had to work overnight, I tried calling him. No answer and after a few tries, straight to voicemail. He had turned his phone off. This was the point where I lost it. But I couldn't leave or vent because of the kids. I'm not proud of what I did. I went slowly though each room trying to create as much unnoticeable chaos as possible. I removed the most useful screwdriver from his toolbox, broke all the filaments in his spare bulbs, swapped the washing and dishwasher powder for a mixture of flour, sugar and whatever else I could find, I filed one of his professional certificates required for audits in a folder he wouldn't look in. I put jam underneath the soles of his hiking boots, started unpicking the buttons on a few of his shirts, same with the flies on his favorite pairs of pants, I changed his Wi-Fi and router passwords. I guess you get the idea. My final act at 6am just before I had to wake the kids up and act like everything was fine was to disable the chip in his passport and slightly deface it so it might look like it was forged. I guess Covid has made that redundant. Anyway. I left things a few days and avoided too much contact. Then I messaged him saying I didn't feel I was really invested in the relationship anymore and I was sorry and hoped he had a nice life. He tried calling numerous times. I blocked him everywhere and haven't heard from him since. The next one is titled, Lie to get free pizza. Enjoy the do not deliver list. This didn't happen to me, but to a fellow employee and friend of mine whom we'll call Chris. A couple of years back, Chris used to work at a Papa John's pizza location. My friend has delivered to some rather interesting characters in his time there. But there was one guy that took the cake. Anytime my coworker would deliver pizzas to this man whom we'll call Oscar, the latter would always pretend he wasn't home anytime the former came with his pizza. So every time Chris was unsuccessful in delivering any pizzas, Oscar would call Chris's Papa John's location and lie about his pizza not being delivered. As a compensation, Oscar would get a free pizza. After many attempts to deliver to Oscar and several times of being unsuccessful, Chris got fed up and decided to take matters into his own hands. The last time he went to deliver to Oscar, Chris used the camera on his phone to record evidence that the cheapskate wasn't accepting his order and pretending his pizzas weren't being delivered. Once Chris showed his proof to his boss, Oscar was placed on a do not deliver list. Today's moral? Don't lie to get free pizza unless you want to never get any again. The next one is titled, I got a sex offender arrested. 
About a year ago I finally decided to get out on my own for good and true because living with other people causes me unending stress. But the only way to get into a place quickly was to take a unit on the edge of the not so nice district of town. I figured since there was a police station literally across the road I would be safe. Needless to say, I don't live there anymore. At first everything seemed fine. I got all my stuff moved in, started learning how to cook stuff more complicated than chicken soup, it was all good. Most everyone in my row of units tended to keep themselves to themselves. Apart from my neighbor on one side making noisy love under shower at 2 in the morning, everyone left me alone. Except this one dude. He was in the unit on the other side from the shower sex people, and he was, in retrospect, way too enthusiastic to have a single lady moving in next door. He was constantly coming over just to say hi and see how I was settling in and often had to be physically pushed out the door. He often stank of booze and took advantage of the summer weather and sealed windows, no crap, this place had locked windows and tenants didn't get keys to them, to come wandering in when I was working. He drove me nuts, but seemed relatively harmless. The first sign that something wronger than the guy being completely unable to get the message to duck off and leave me alone was when the cops came around to try and serve a warrant on him. I don't know exactly what came of that, but he swore blind they'd actually been after the previous tenant and he hadn't come out because he was sleeping. Which in retrospect I was an idiot for believing, because I am a heavy sleeper and they woke me up. Then he asked if he could use my computer to check his email because his was in the shop. I let him because it got him to shut up and let me work faster. I didn't think much of this until one night when he and the guy from the unit on the other side of him got a bit drunk and came over asking to watch Top Gear. The other guy was very nice and friendly, even drunk, but he got louder and more and more raucous until he crossed the line and made some jokes about hitting the other guy. I told him not to make those jokes and to get out, and while he was leaving I heard the words, I'm not ducking joking, I'll hit him if he doesn't shut the duck up. Next day I spoke to the other dude and found out his computer had been confiscated by the police. The neighbor then promptly disappeared for a month, and I had the real estate agents asking me if I had any idea where he'd gone and why he wasn't paying rent. He then promptly reappeared, paid his owing rent, and went around boasting that he'd had so many parking tickets they'd arrested him. I don't know much about the law but I know you don't get a month in jail here for tickets. I still would have let it pass, except I came down with the gastric flu and was very, very, very sick for a week, and every time the neighbor turned up I had to tell him to go away. This week was also the week a tornado hit upstate and the heavy winds caused a lot of property damage all over our city and between the noise and the flu I didn't get more than about 10 minutes sleep for the entire week. The neighbor turned up at 11 pm one night demanding to let me in, and in my miserable, sick, sleep deprived state, I told him to duck right off. The next day the seat and tires of my motorcycle were cut to ribbons. Even though the police and I both knew damn well who did it, without any physical evidence or a witness they couldn't actually do anything. Revenge was now going to be mine. First I let neighbor use my computer again. He had a habit of not signing out of his email, so instead of doing what I usually did and signing out for him, I left him logged in, and called an old school friend. Said school friend is now a cop. I explained the situation to him, and as soon as I named names he told me to stay logged in and he'd be right over. Two hours later my computer was being examined by a police department technician who downloaded pretty much everything the guy had ever written to anyone. I didn't see much but what I did see was ducking sick. I then gave statements to a few officers, and found out that when neighbor was in jail for parking tickets, he was actually in trouble for drugging and trying to sexually assault a girl in a local bar and had only gotten out because his mum had posted bail, despite him being a registered sex offender. The prison he'd been in didn't even have a low security wing. He'd obviously lied to the real estate agents about what was actually going on because any criminal record beyond parking or speeding tickets made them reject you for rental. Neighbor was arrested again for something they'd wanted to pin on him but hadn't been able to until they got the emails, I got subpoenaed as a witness, and he got carted off to await trial. And then, just to add insult to injury, my policeman friend called the real estate agents about his record and he got evicted. I saw him in court last week when I gave my testimony, and he lost his crap when he realized I was the one who'd finally gotten the police the evidence they needed to send him down. I then got the glorious pleasure of hearing him sentenced to 10 years. The last one is titled, Forgive Until They Forget.
Back in high school, I was more of a nerd than not, but I also had a diverse group of friends. So I had an in with most of the cliques, and those that I didn't necessarily agree with were usually far enough removed that I never had any problems with them directly. However, the few that I silently resented were public enemies of a sort. Anyway, there was this one kid a year my senior, let's call him Caucus the Ball Master, or CM for short. For the better part of my first three years, I see CM around and am generally left with a sour taste. It's the usual bullshit, calling people out for whatever reason, then taking it out on professors who try to intervene. There were a few run-ins with the law in CM's short and illustrious career as professional douchebag, too. But again, nothing that directly involved me. That is, until spring semester of the 11th grade. One day when we were packing up from an orchestra rehearsal, both percussionists, we happened to be in the same band this semester. It was a split campus school, and he went to the other one, but a few classes were only taught at one, and students were shuttled between them. Good Ole Ball Master accidentally left his iPod on a chair, which we later learned. Well, come Monday morning, he's on a warpath. CM accuses one of my good friends of stealing it, who I knew well enough to put my own reputation for his character, and then I was also accused of theft. A fly on the wall no more, I say. Duck this kid and his crap, I'm not going down for lies. A half-assed investigation gets opened by the school, but about two days later someone thinks to check with the custodial staff. And sure enough, one of the janitors picked it up over the weekend and put it in the lost and found. After that incident, CM kept a little distance from me and my friend, but there was a colder sense of animosity towards us as though we had accused him of the theft, not the other way around. By the end of the year, I hadn't had an opportunity to take revenge on Caucus for what he did to us and to dozens of others, which included destruction of personal property, vandalism, and a lot of the petty crap. It seemed that my chances were slipping away, but then a good old deus ex machina came our way and he got held back another year. Jackpot. Karma came around and gave him a swift kick up the butt, but it was also right into our laps. Asterisk the revenge asterisk, flash forward to spring semester of our senior year. I'm taking a biology class, and it's another one of the shared ones. Guess who's there? Our mate Caucus the ball master. Although he doesn't acknowledge our prior standing, I sure as hell do. Forgive and forget, I try and live by. But sometimes life just doesn't want that to happen, so duck him. To quickly set the stage, this biology room, like most of the building, was constructed back in the 40s, and hadn't seen many renovations since the 70s when a few additions were built. All the lab tables were that indestructible black synthetic rock stuff, each shaped like a pentagon where one side joined it to the wall. Each of those sides held a row of four drawers, individually keyed, as well as two more columns of drawers on the walls between the island pods. There were somewhere around 8 to 10 of them in the room, making for a metric shit of drawers, around 225 of them in total. For the most part, we used the front of the classroom, but occasionally we went to the back to dissect cats and crap. One lab, I opened one of the drawers out of curiosity, but it was empty. Turns out, they all were, and hadn't been used for quite some time. What a waste. Dot dot dot. What an opportunity a few days later, I stumbled across an old box filled with verdigris brass keys. I just had to know. Each one was paired with an identical key on an old spiral ring, and each one went to one of the 200 odd drawers. And that's where the plot was hatched. Over the course of about two months with the help of another one of my quietly unsuspecting yet marvelously devious friends, we began mapping out where all the keys went. Our professor was one of the best I ever had, and being a class at the end of the day, usually we would have some time where he would answer questions and help people with whatever, and the rest of us could do whatever work we needed to get done. That meant a few minutes every day where we could slip away to the lab tables and look like we were doing homework unsupervised. When we finally had all the keys paired to their locks, we took half a dozen or so each day and progressively locked them in different drawers. So if you had one key, you would have to find the drawer it opened, and there would be another key inside, which opened a different drawer, which had another key. You get the idea. But because there were two keys, we could keep the key for the last drawer on hand and open it whenever we wanted to. But the other was locked away in one of the drawers. And also since there were two, we unpaired them and ever 50 drawers or so, we put a mountain of the previously used keys in it. Sort of like a, congratulations, duck you. Two weeks after we started, we locked the last key away, leaving us with the one for the final drawer, and one for the first drawer. 
For good measure, we made the final draw on the top so you couldn't somehow jimmy the ones above it open and reach your hand down. By now, it was drawing near the end of the semester, and so we waited for our opportunity to give CM the petty shitstorm of a lifetime. And our chance came at the best possible time. Two days before the end of the term, Cocos left the room for something, and also left that ducking iPod on his desk. When the opportunity arose, I casually lifted it and some other douchey personal effects. Into the last draw they went. I had been ready for this moment for months, and looking at the inconspicuously, horrifically devious sabotage made me so happy I could sing, no one wants that. Of course, CM doesn't notice that the iPod is gone, again, and leaves for the day. Come the last day of classes I drop an envelope on his desk when everyone is packing their final things for the year. Inside was the first key and a note scrawled the words, want to play a game? This was the height of when Saw was becoming popular, and come cryptic crap about what he had to do to get his things back. If I could have taken a photograph of his face when he realized what happened, I would need nothing more out of life. Of course, I didn't stick around to see if he ever made it to the last draw, but no one would help poor Cocos the ball master. My only regret is that I could not have done it sooner. Duck that guy. Thanks for listening.